as I referred to last Sunday, we considered our Lord's letter to the church in Sardis. And there was a keynote in this letter, or that letter, I should say, to the church in Sardis. And the keynote, in case you missed it, was one of rebuke. Our Lord rebuked them because for all of their outward performance, inwardly, there was something desperately lacking. They were actually dead. They, they had a name for life, but actually on the inside, there was nothing going on. It, they were dead. And many in the church had become compromised and defiled. That was Sardis. But the situation in Philadelphia couldn't have been any different. It was completely a different situation. Our Lord only had encouragement for the church at Philadelphia. And their name is significant. Now we perhaps associate it with soft, spreadable cheese. Um, but, but actually the name means brotherly love. What a, what a lovely name for a church. Here is a church that is full of brotherly love. Here was a church who were walking with the Lord in the light of his word. They were earnestly seeking to honour and glorify his name in their lives together. This was a church that knew the blessing of God upon them, because where brothers dwell together in unity, God commands the blessing. And so the Lord honoured them with three precious promises, all of which are absolutely relevant to us. And so we're going to consider these promises, and I hope on the back of our week of prayer, it will prove to be of great encouragement to us. So here's the first promise. The promise of an open door. The promise of an open door. The first encouragement for us this evening is that our Lord and Saviour opened up a door for effective ministry for the church at Philadelphia. It was the Lord's doing. He opened it up for them in order that they would be effective in their ministry. Look at verse 8. See, I have set before you an open door. An open door for what? An open door for the gospel. For the good news about Jesus Christ, that he is the saviour, that he has come into the world to save sinners, that he has done it, that it is complete, that there is a full salvation available, purchased with the blood of Christ, that Christ has come. That this gospel ministry, as it is preached and proclaimed, would be met with blessing and fruitfulness, and that men and women and boys and girls would be truly saved. An open door for the gospel. This was often Paul's experience. On a number of occasions he speaks of doors being opened to him for effective ministry. I'll just give you two examples. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 9, Paul says this, For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. He was recognising that, that when God is at work, Satan is also at work because he hates the work of God. And so there is an effective door. It, it's been wide open, and it's brought with it adversaries. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. A door for effective ministry. And when the Lord opens a door, verse 8, 
No one can shut it. No one out the church, no one in the church, even though there's adversaries. If he opens it, no one can shut it. Not even Satan. Look at verse 9. The synagogue of Satan. These Jews who thought they were Jews, but they weren't really Jews, condemned by the Lord himself, this, these ones who were standing in opposition to the gospel. Not even they could shut the door. Why is that? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Because of who has opened it. Look at verse 7. These things says he who is holy, he who is true. That Jesus is holy reminds us that he is God, that all power and all authority belongs to him. And when he decides to open a door, no one and nothing is able to blockade it or force it shut. He's opened the door, and so it, it is open. The Holy One, God himself. But verse 7 um, also tells us, as I've read, that he who is true. And that reminds us that he is true to his promise and to his words. And that he can absolutely be relied upon. He is holy, he is true, and when he opens a door, no one can shut it. But verse 7 goes on. Look at it with me, the second part of verse 7. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. That Christ holds the key of David is a reference back to Isaiah 22 and verse 22. In Isaiah's day, the one who held the key of David had the right to refuse entry or to allow entry, to invite entry into the presence of the king, the earthly king. But the Lord Jesus Christ, to him belongs the ultimate key of David. As he himself has said, John 14, 6, no one comes to the Father but by me. This encompasses everything, doesn't it? The effectiveness of our ministry, how it is that it is to be undertaken, an opening for it, and salvation itself, it all belongs to the Lord. He opens effective doors for ministry. He gives times and seasons of blessing to his church. He gives revival to his church. He strengthens his church. But as well as all of this, he alone is the one who opens the way to God and gives salvation. He holds the key. What an encouragement this is to us to pray that he would open an effective door of ministry for us here. We know who gives it from start to finish, and so we must ask him for it in the open air, amongst the youth, Thursday, or the many elderly people in our community and who are already coming to the luncheon club, we need to take up the prayer in Colossians 4, verse 3. I encourage you to turn there or to, or to make a mental note of this. Colossians 4, 3. That God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. An open door is needed. But there's another encouragement here for us. And it is found in the reason that our Lord gave to the church that he opened this door for them in the first place. Look at it, verse 8. And it's not what we would expect. For you have a little strength. You are small in strength. You have a little strength. But look what our Lord goes on to say. For you have a little strength, 
have kept my word and have not denied my name. It was a church that though it was little, it had a little strength, perhaps they were the lowest in society, perhaps they were smaller in number, perhaps they didn't have influence amongst this, um, this city of Philadelphia. We could surmise as to why they had little strength. They were faithful to the Lord. What an encouragement. We are not particularly big. In many senses, we're not placed in a situation that is uh, sort of strategic. Um, we're aging. We are of little strength. But the Lord is able to open a door for effective ministry here at Boris Park. This is a great encouragement for us to pray that he would do it. Secondly, the promise of being kept from the hour of trial. Say it again. The promise of being kept from the hour of trial. We get this in verse 10. Because you have kept my commands to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. In the immediate context, this hour of trial referred to the wave of persecution that was going to sweep through the then known world and sift out the wheat from the chaff and, and, and be absolutely um, weighing upon the people of God, put them under great pressure. It would test those who confessed Christ as their saviour and king to the limit. We're not the only ones who've suffered for the faith. In fact, all those who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And this was true right at the beginning. We can think of Nero using Christians in his gardens as human torches. He burned them in his gardens or of sending them out for sports to the animals uh, in the, in the, uh, at their games. But though that was true in the immediate context, it has been true down through the ages of church history. There were many martyrs for the evangelical faith at the time of the Reformation and before it. In our own United Kingdom, we think of Latimer and Ridley, they immediately come to mind of those who were burnt at the stake for the faith. There was great persecution against the Scottish Covenanters in the 17th century. You can go to the spot in Edinburgh, the grass market. We used to go there and we used to do outreach and you can see, I think there's marked, I'm pretty sure I remember rightly, there's marked a cross where they were murdered for their faithfulness to Christ. The same is true of the Huguenots in France. As Protestants under a Catholic rule, they were violently persecuted. We, we know about it, but we can hardly imagine it, can we? We just come to church, we, we just live our lives, we just bear witness to the faith. And though we may be shunned, we don't expect this. And the list could go right on until the present day. I, I recently read a biography of, of a couple who took their young family, three or four children, to Turkey, only to have their lives ripped apart and devastated by cruel hate. When in 2007, the father, Tilman Gesk, along with two other missionaries, was brutally murdered when he was just working in his office. They were there to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and he was killed in cruel hate. And his wife was widowed and his children were orphaned, all for the sake of Christ. The book is called Married to a Martyr. In the light of all of this, what does it mean that Christ will keep, we put our names there, us? from the hour of trial. Doesn't mean that there will be a rapture. 
that it will take us out of the time of trial. The time of trial is since uh, Christ has uh, been raised from the dead and ascended back to the uh, back up into heaven. Uh, God's people have always suffered trial, and so too today. Though the promise is that He will keep us from falling away. Let me quote to you the hymn. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. You know, sometimes those trials lead to death leads to life being taken away. But even then, God's people are kept because of the truth of Romans 8.28. All things work together for good, and we mustn't stop there. To those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What's his purpose for them? that they should come into glory. This night might not sound very encouraging to us. And the truth is that none of us knows what is around the corner. We, we have got no idea what 2023 holds for any of us. We think back over 2022 and, and the bumps that there were in the road and the changes of direction and the, the news, whether good or bad, and we think, what has 2023 got ahead? But even though we don't know that, we do have the promise of verse 11. Behold, listen up, take note of this. I am coming quickly. How does Christ come to us? We think of 2023 laid out ahead of us and we've already entered it. But he comes by his Holy Spirit to re relieve our sorrows, isn't he? As believers, we've known that, haven't we? If, if we are believers in Christ, there have been times when by the sending of a friend or by hearing a message or by reading something in the morning or, or just by something coming to our minds, we are lifted. The Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, by his Spirit, comes to us and we are relieved. The Lord comes to us. How else does he come to us? He comes to us by his act of providence to deliver us. There are times when the situation so unbelievably changes that, that he takes us out of our current situation and into a new one, and we, and we come out and we find ourselves in a wide place. The Lord has come to us. We've been delivered in a way that we never thought possible. He comes to his dying saints. They're on their deathbed. And to the family all around, uh, they're praying. And what, maybe they're praying that, that there'll be healing or that there'll be a raising up again. And then the saint dies. The Lord has come to his servant and taken him home. But all of these point us, they are all foretastes of the fact that one day Jesus will come again. To the believers in Philadelphia, this was an encouragement that their struggles would soon be over. Paul says it, doesn't he? That these momentary sufferings, these light sufferings, and he suffered greatly, are nothing to be compared with the eternal weight in glory. So all they needed to do was to hold fast, verse 11. And that's what we need to do. We need to hold, that, hold fast. We need to keep on going, keep on trusting, keep on believing, keep on standing for the faith, and holding it out. The crown of righteousness was already theirs. 
By faith, by grace, it is already ours. The Lord, the righteous judge, is waiting to give it to us. If we are found in Christ this evening. And all that they had to do and all that we have to do is hold fast. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Have we believed? Keep on believing. Are we standing? Keep on standing. And our Lord will keep us in the hour of trial. But thirdly and finally, the promise of absolute security. Well, let's pause. May the Lord help us. There's something for us to hear here. So strengthen yourselves to keep on listening and let's uh, see what the Lord has to say to us. There's already been a number of images um, that our Lord has used um, in this letter uh, that speak of spiritual realities. Verse 7, a key being held. It's an image with a spiritual reality. Number eight, a door being opened. It's an image with a spiritual reality. And then number, verse nine, a synagogue of Satan. It's an image, but it speaks of something very real. And in the last promise, we have three more. They're all found in verse 12. There's a pillar, a temple, and a city. And I want us to look at the first two together. He who overcomes, verse 12, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and, sh and he shall go out no more. What does this mean? Well, a temple. Temple here doesn't stand for a literal building but is representative of God's dwelling amongst his people. And that, that's what happened in the Old Testament, isn't it? God rescued his people out of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness and then set up his tabernacle that he might dwell amongst his people. And, and then a temple was built. And why was a temple built? So that God could be amongst his people. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, what did he do? He tabernacled amongst his people. God came down to be with his people. And one day we will be with him forever. We have it in chapter 21 and verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle, the temple, the dwelling of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his God. God himself will be with them and be their God. To those who persevere in faith, unbroken communion and fellowship and joy forever and ever in the presence of God is promised. If this doesn't lift us, if we don't desire it, then there's something spiritually wrong. We're more like Sardis in spiritual death. To be with God forever. That is the end of the gospel. And that leads us to this picture of a pillar. What does it mean that those who overcome, God's saints, those who belong to Christ, will be a pillar in the temple of God. So God's temple represents God's people with God, fellowship together. What then does it mean to be a pillar in the temple of God? It means that they will abide forever in the presence of God. The Philadelphia region was famed for its earthquakes, so I read in the commentators, which cause pillars to topple and to fall. And so when this church in Philadelphia heard the Lord say, 
as he does here in verse 12. A pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. They knew exactly what he meant. They weren't going to leave, they weren't going to topple, they weren't going to fall. They were there forever. The Lord's people are not collapsing pillars. They are sturdy ones that remain. You, you might feel as if you are a collapsing pillar this evening. That you're, you're shaking and you're struggling to stand. Well, here's a promise even for you as you look to the Lord in faith. That God's people are to him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul exhorts the believers in Corinth to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Keep on keeping on. And our Lord Jesus promises that for, for those of us who do, they will stand forever in the new creation to come. Isn't it incredible that what we do in this life really does have eternal consequences? We need to keep that ever in mind. That's why it's a fearful thing to preach, because a preacher will stand before the Lord for what they have preached. But so too will a listener. We will stand before the Lord for the way that we have listened. That's what verse 13, is it verse 13, have I got it right? Is all about. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Our Lord Jesus promises us that we will stand if we persevere in the faith. This doesn't in any way deny the grace of God in salvation, but it is a poignant reminder that those who endure to the end will be saved. Matthew 24, 14. But what if the city, at the temple, the pillar, the city? Well, let's look at the second part of verse 12. I will write on him the name of my God. Um, please notice this repeated word. And the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. Again, we have reference to this city, which is described as the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21. And in verse 1 of Revelation 21, we hear these words, Then I, John, saw the holy city, the city that's referred to uh, in the letter to Philadelphia, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What is this great city that is pictured Emerging from the sky, how are we to understand it? I mean, you, you imagine like a child, don't you? This great city and the earth all around it and below it, coming down out of the sky, coming down from heaven, and then founding itself, planting itself in the new heaven and the new earth. What is it? It is God's gathered church. There is coming a day when all of the redeemed will come together in the presence of their God and King, the New Jerusalem. And they will all have one thing in common. They will carry the Lord's name on them, which is to say that they are owned by him and they belong to him. Isn't it wonderful to belong to the Lord? How is this possible for sinners like you and me? In verse 12, 
it is difficult to miss the phrase that is repeated that I highlighted to us four times. My God, my God, my God, my God. What does this remind you of? Where else is this said in the scriptures? Repeated twice. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did our Lord say this? Because he had taken the punishment to make this possible. What a wonderful reminder this is to us that all that the Lord Jesus shares with us and all that God gives to us is only made possible because Christ was struck off for us because he was forsaken for us, because he bled and died for us, so that now, by faith, we can say and sing with the hymn writer, our God is the end of the journey, his pleasant and glorious domain, for there are the children of mercy who praise him, for Calvary's pain. May it both break our hearts and fill our hearts that this was accomplished for us. I've used a couple of times the word possible. It's not just made possible. It was done. It's completed. As one writer wrote it, redemption accomplished and applied. So with the great promises of an open door and the exhortation to pray that the Lord would open one here and being kept from the hour of trial and with absolute security that belongs to us as the people of God, more happy but not more secure and the sanctified spirits in heaven, what do we do? We keep on keeping on. We keep on in his word we keep on refusing to deny his name amongst our family, at work, wherever we are. We keep on persevering in the faith. And we keep on hearing what the Lord is saying to us. Verse 13. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Before I close, I was at um, uh, Shrewsbury this morning, and, uh, and as I pulled into the car park, they share their car park with the local football club, and the, uh, and the car park was just full of cars, and I managed to find the space. And then when I went in, and they were all playing out there, and it was like, oh, you know, if only you know, we could reach them or whatever. And then I saw they had their boards out with their verses, and then I saw that, um, then they told me that after the service, they put a table out and they put teas and coffees and biscuits and chocolates out. And then because they finish their football at the same time as the church finishes its service. And as they came out, they were giving them the teas and the coffees. The Lord had opened up a door for them. May it be a door for effective ministry. That this would lead to something else. And then it would be seen that the Lord is truly in it. Take encouragement. The Lord can open up a door for us. And small things can be used of God to bring him great glory.